Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm Dr. Lucy Kalanithi. I'm an internist uh, on faculty at Stanford um, with a career focused on healthcare value. I'm so happy that you came to find us at this panel this morning. We know that you had several terrifying options of panels to choose from. There was one on climate crisis, one on online disinformation, um, our panel on death and dying, and then there was a very terrifying one called Venture Capital Comes to Women's Health. <laughs> That's actually a joke because it's a panel of really amazing women VCs, but um, we're so glad you found us, and I think it's gonna be a really beautiful panel today. Our panelists here are using both ancient wisdom and modern technology to help us take care of each other at the end of life. So let me just give you a little intro to each of them and then we'll answer some really big questions over the course of about a half an hour. And then we'll have about 15 minutes or so for audience questions. So as things come up, feel free to think of something you might wanna ask and we can call on you. And there will be a little time afterward for you to come talk to the panelists individually. They each have some slides that they prepared that are mainly to give some visual interest to what they're talking about. So feel free to take pictures of those slides. It includes the way to contact them or access their work. So first, Elua Arthur is on our panel, and she describes herself as a recovering lawyer who is the founder of Going With Grace. She's a death doula who carries out death doula trainings and end of life planning and her organization exists to help people answer the question, what must I do to be at peace with myself so that I may live presently and die gracefully? Alua has also said that her work is actually activism cloaked in compassion. Katrina Spade is on our panel, and she's an entrepreneur and designer who invented a modern process for human composting. She's the founder of Recompose, which is the world's first human composting company and a full service funeral home. And she's a leader in expanding legalization of natural organic reduction to, to reform death care practices in the United States. And everyone on this panel has taken some kind of unexpected path, not least of which is Dan Diaz. Dan is an advocate for expanding end of life options for terminally ill people. And he's continuing the work that he started with his late wife, Brittany Menard, who died in 2014 after a really brave and arduous and ultimately beautiful process to access medical aid in dying when she was um, dying with a terminal, uh, dying with an advanced brain tumor. And Dan's voice has been instrumental in legislative victories for medical aid in dying across the US, including in California, Colorado, New Jersey, and Washington, DC. So let's get started. Um, our panel is called Designing a Good Death, and I know that's something a lot of people wonder about is, is there such thing as a good death, and what does that actually look like? And so I want to hear from each of our panelists what they would say about that, and we'll hear from Elua, and then Dan, and then Katrina. Thank you. Uh, good morning. I'm happy to be here. Um, as Lucy mentioned, my name is Elua Arthur, and I'm the founder of Going With Grace. Um, when I think about a good death, I, I focus a lot on uh, the, 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 the world around what death and dying looks like. For so many of us, we approach the idea of a good death thinking about having access to information so we can make informed decisions, um, being in a place where we are comfortable, having our wishes respected, uh, having lived a good life. So ultimately, I think the idea about a good death is really rooted in whether or not we're capable of living a good life. A good life, as we know, it is based on a lot of different factors, which are designed mostly by ourselves as we live. But I think one thing that we often forget or goes missing in the conversation about a good death is the fact that uh, death is a culturally, socially constructed process that's based upon social power dynamics. Death is not a medical event, it's a social mm -hmm. one. We're doing it in community. We live in community, and thus we die in community. And so since death is a social event that is really informed by social power dynamics, it's important that we think about all the social power dynamics that go into how we live and thus how we die. A big portion of the work that we do at Going With Grace is to support people in creating that death for themselves, creating the death that feels most authentic, most ideal for themselves under the circumstances. 
Um, that death looks like a lot of different things for a lot of different people. So no matter what the needs may be, whether or not they be practical, emotional, legal, spiritual, our job is to support people to create the most ideal death for themselves under the circumstances. You may have heard that I didn't use the term good death in that. I use the most ideal death for themselves under the circumstances because all those are a factor. When I think about a good death, I often wonder who it's for. Who is it for? Is it for the person who's dying? And if it is, who's going to judge? You know, I wonder after death if there's somebody waiting saying A plus or you, <laughs> you know, how, do we, how are we to judge what a good death was for that person? Or is it really for the people that are left behind, the people that love the person who died? Are they judging what that good death was? Thinking about death in terms of good and bad often creates a binary that I find can be harmful and difficult for folks as they try to internalize and process what it is that occurred. I mean, if any of you all have ever sat witness to somebody dying, you understand what a massive event it is that's occurring. And as it's occurring, if we're constantly sitting in judgment of what it is that's occurring, it's, um, it's a little harder to just be with it as it is. Is that clear? You understand what I'm saying? We think of it in terms of good and bad, which creates a judgment around it, which I think cannot, doesn't serve the people that are left behind after the death occurs. Um, ideally, folks have an opportunity to consider their entire lives, who they were, um, what they cared about, the impact that they had on those that they loved, and they are able to wrap up all parts of who they were, all parts of their identity as they lay dying. This is part of why Lucy said before that I think of my work as activism cloaked in compassion and love because in order for folks to have a good death, we must, we must, we must, we must honor the totality of their lived experience. That means looking at the intersection of their identities for all that they were, not just the parts that we see or the parts that we think are worthy, but for every part of who they were. And I think if we can do that adequately in death, they can have good deaths. Uh, I think we should also be able to do it in life and people can have good lives as well. Thank you. Thank you. Can I interrupt you? Can, could you just give an example? Like, that's really hard to answer those questions for yourself. Can you give an example of what kinds of process you go through to help someone get in touch with who they are and what their life means? And like, how does that happen? It's a big, big, big job to be done mm -hmm. while we're dying, which is why I suggest we don't wait. All right, we have our entire lives to get to, this, to the root of this question. I think for many of us, we have a lot of clarity about what we enjoy, the things that give our lives meaning, but they're also informed by societal expectations. And I think a lot of the process of getting to a good death is by reconciling who we were with who we thought we were supposed to be, who society told us we were supposed to be, et cetera. And so a lot of it, also the process of elderhood, is shedding those expectations and living in a life that's authentic to who we, who we are, as opposed to you know, all the things that I thought I was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. uh, you have said before, I was a lawyer. I started out my professional work as a lawyer, and that did not work out so well for mm -hmm. me. Um, it led to a very serious clinical depression where I took a leave of absence and went to Cuba where I met a young woman on a bus who had terminal uh, cervical cancer. We talked a lot about her life, and then we talked about her death, and I started thinking about death for the very first time, like, wow. She's going to die, she's only a few years older than I was. And in thinking about her death, I started to think about mine. Like, what, what would my life have meant if this is it? Am I pleased with all the choices I've made? I am the only one who will have to contend with all of my choices at my death, and so why not start doing it now? Mm. Why not live a life that's absolutely authentic to me according to my values, the way that I see the world, exactly the way that I want to live it? That's the only way to a good life and ultimately to a mm. good death. Thank you. Thank you. Dan Diaz. Um, <clears throat> so my answer as far as is achieving a, a good death um, possible, uh, or what does that mean, um, it follows suit with what Alua has already brought up, which is that's going to be different for every individual. And really, the only thing that matters is what that individual wants, what they feel is important. Um, and I'll share some of that or um, how that played out for, for Brittany. So just by way of reintroducing her story, um, <clears throat> this is my wife, Brittany Menard. Uh, she died November 1st of 2014. Uh, she was only 29 years old. Um, <clears throat> and it was a brain tumor that she was battling. The, um, 
we discovered that tumor on New Year's Day. Um, she underwent brain surgery just 10, 10 days later. So January 10th uh, is an eight-hour surgery to debulk was the mm -hmm. term that they used. Mm -hmm. And that's to remove the tumor material that they could safely get to in order to create enough space in her skull so that the current symptoms that she was experiencing, the nausea, the vomiting, the inability to sleep, the pain at the base of her skull, so that those symptoms would subside. Um, after that surgery, they were only able to remove about 35% of that brain tumor. Uh, it was so large and so diffuse, there's just parts of the brain that you cannot send a scalpel. Um, so after that surgery, they informed Brittany that she likely had three, maybe five years to live. Uh, at age 29, that felt like she was being told, you're going to die tomorrow. Uh, unfortunately, just two months later at the first follow-up MRI, the tumor had changed grades, was growing aggressively. Uh, of the space they had created, within those two months, 20% of that space had already been filled. So now the tumor is growing um, very fast, uh, indicative of a, GB, a glioblastoma multiform, so the most aggressive type of brain cancer. And at that point, they, <clears throat> they told Brittany that six months, with the trajectory of how fast this is growing, that's all the time you have. Um, so with that, with that information, Brittany said, well, we will continue to fight. That's what you do when you have cancer, you fight. Um, <clears throat> but she said, uh, we will, no, the emotion just comes. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but she said, we, we, will, we will fight this battle from Oregon, because uh, at least in, <clears throat> in Oregon at that time, they had their death with dignity law. So at that point, there were, there were four states that uh, <clears throat> allowed a terminally ill individual, ah, the voice just gets shaky, but don't worry, I'm, I'm doing okay. Um, the, um, the, um, uh, her navigating that, that time that she would have left, she said, if we do it from Oregon, at least there she knows that she could take back that little bit of control from that tumor uh, and, ha and have some say as to how her dying process how her final few days on this green earth might play out. So we packed up half of our house in California uh, into a U-Haul truck. Uh, Brittany had to find a house for us to rent on Craigslist. Um, we said goodbye to our friends and family. We, she had to find a new medical team, established residency. Nobody should have to do this at end of life after being told that you have six months. Uh, and we drove 600 miles north to Portland. Um, and once we were there, she then applied for, qualified for, and was granted that prescription. It's a sleeping medication, by the way. So just to demystify it. Um, the process, and, and then I'm going to get to and, and kind of wrap up this part of it, it, it as far as that, that idea of, of um, designing um, a good death. For her, two physicians have to agree that you're terminally ill, which means six months or less to live. You have to be mentally competent. You make the request both verbally and in writing. There's a waiting period. There's witnesses involved. It's very protective. Um, and once she received that medication, she put it in the cupboard, and she focused on living life. Um, it just meant that she didn't have to be so terrified mm. of how her dying process might go. Um, so. <clears throat> We lived for those six months up in Portland, Oregon, doing the things that matter to Brittany. Uh, and now I'm kind of fast forwarding, skipping a lot, but on the day that Brittany decided that uh, at that point, she would sleep with this beanbag pillow. We would warm it up in the microwave, and, um, but the pain at the base of her skull that not even morphine could alleviate, and, and the seizures, those terrified her the most. Um, the nausea, the vomiting, those things, she's, it got to a point where she recognized, I would prefer to pass away gently now versus pick a number. Do I live another 10 days, two weeks? I'll only be suffering during that time. Uh, if she suffers a stroke and then she's paralyzed, Brittany says, no, 
She refused to allow the disease to be in the driver's seat and, and, and dictate how much of that suffering she might have to endure. So for Brittany, it was November 1st on the day that she decided. Um, within five minutes of taking that medication, Brittany fell asleep very peacefully. Within 30 minutes, her breathing slowed to the point where she passed away. So for her, that was her good death experience. In her words, it's like, you, we only get to do this once. We only die once. She wasn't going to throw uh, or, or, or allow the disease to, to control how much the, of, not just the suffering, but how that experience would go, not just for herself, but obviously for the rest of us, the, the family and loved ones that are left behind. So um, that is, and she spoke up along the way being her legacy, she was trying to affect change um, so that nobody would ever have to leave. I mentioned there were four states that allowed this option when she died. Um, the promise I made to her was to t help pass legislation in more states, so we're now up to 11 states. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, and I'm very much appreciative to Aspen uh, and this panel for the opportunity to share, you know, Brittany's story and, and um, what, uh, <clears throat> uh, what she stood for and, and, and the uh, selflessness in her final few months of living uh, to really to help the rest of us. So, thanks. Yeah, thank you. So Katrina Speed, your work is focused on after someone dies and thinking about death care in that way. Could you talk about how you think about making that process good or better? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you for that story. It was so beautiful. I feel like we maybe need to take just a moment. <laughs> um, and I, I know Brittany would be very proud of you sitting up here today. Thanks. 11 states. I mean, that is awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm going to take you back 10 years now to um, my time in, as a design student, um, as the topic of this panel is designing a good death. Um, and, but I, I, th I think you'll see that the common theme I'm feeling from all of us is intentionality. Mm. And so however that can play out for us when it comes to the end of life, our elderhood, um, and then um, what we do with our bodies after we die, I think that's really the theme here, is how to be intentional. I don't think there's any wrong choices around this stuff, there's, um, but as long as you're making a choice, that is, that's sort of the ideal, I think. So back in grad school, I went to architecture school a little bit late, and I had two young kids, which is important, because for those of you with young children, you know how fast they grow up. That that daily recognition that your kid is getting older, it hit me one morning that I was growing at the same rate and kind of terrified me a little bit <laughs> because I was like, oh, my cute little one and a half year old will be 40 someday and I did the math and I, I realized I'd be old, if, if God willing, right? So um, with that in mind and with architecture school as my main focus, I looked at the American funeral industry, which is, by the way, a fascinating story that I can't go into because of time, but I, rec I recommend you take a look at it sometime. It hasn't really been innovated upon over the last hundred years. We have cremation and then conventional burial, which here in the US means body into casket, typically embalmed first. That casket resides in a concrete grave liner, and then you have a cemetery, of course. And then cremation, which importantly is um, rising in popularity and is now somewhere around 60% of Americans choose cremation today, and it's expected to be 80% in the next mm. 20 years, I think. Don't quote me. Um, <laughs> so anyway, so setting that up, I was interested in the, um, the funeral industry, and the choices for my own body when I died, purely from a design perspective, not ever expecting to make something that would exist, certainly not have a business plan around it. And I found out about this practice that farmers use to uh, recycle livestock back to the land. It's been practiced for decades in the US. 
And I thought, how beautiful composting cows and horses. If you can do that, certainly you can compost a human being. And I was especially excited about this idea because um, I'd heard about natural burial, where bodies are placed directly in the ground with a shroud or a pine box. It's practiced all over the world today, still. Um, and I love that concept, and I think it's pretty much perfect. <clears throat> but it takes land. And I was interested in looking at the problem of polluting um, funeral practices from an urban perspective. What, what can we do that returns us to nature but doesn't take up lots of land and would work for the billions of us in cities? So this is one of my favorite shots <coughs> of the forest. I love it because it encapsulates what's happening during composting. This is dead organic material and microbes are breaking that material down Breeze is coming through the forest, moisture is coming from above, all of that's creating rich topsoil. And that is what we, we are recreating with a human body at Recompose. If you can change the next slide, I think it will just really help illustrate what I'm talking about. So these are Recompose vessels. So I'm, I'm talking about an urban funeral practice that is, happens inside of a reusable vessel and um, allows us to be transformed into soil over a matter of months, and that soil can then grow on to um, be used on trees, plants, people's gardens, or for conservation work. All along the journey of this, since the last 10 years of this process of bringing this idea to life, which you can see here it is, this is our Seattle facility, we have um, 34 composting vessels. We've composted over 300 people so far. I would say the commonality between every single one of those people is that they chose this. Mm. Um, they looked at burial. Did they want to be buried? They looked at cremation, mm. which is probably what they would have otherwise chosen. And they, in the end, decided, no, I'd like to be transformed into soil, and my family can then have that soil back. And so that intentionality is, is at play, whether you're an environmentalist or, um, or not, but you like the idea of choosing something for your own self. And so um, I guess that's really important as we think about a good death and or the best we can get towards whatever a good death is. Um, the other thing that I'd like to just touch on and then I'll stop for a moment is when we're being intentional about death, what are the ways we can mark that death? And are there ways to bring ritual back to an experience that more and more is just cremate me, don't make a fuss, I don't want to even want a service? Mm -hmm. But my, my question, I guess, to all of you and to the world is, isn't our death kind of the biggest deal? Like, isn't that the moment when we should make a fuss? And if we're gonna make at least a small fuss about it, what does that moment look like? What does ritual look like around when someone dies, especially if we don't have the cultural or religious um, customs that would lead us to know exactly what mm. a good uh, ritual would, would be? So, thank you. Um, thank you so much for these really beautiful and deep and brave and heartbreaking and life-affirming answers to these questions. Um, I have a follow-up question for each of you, and then we can also ask the audience what they would like to know. Um, Elua, I am curious from you, what has been most surprising in your work as a death doula or working on death and dying? Maybe that has affected you in your own life or just surprised you? Sure. There, there's been a lot of surprise. Um, mm. I think first by... The, the greatest surprise that I encountered was how resistant everybody was to talking about death, yeah. to be mm -hmm. honest with you. Even, it had never occurred to me before that I was going to die. I hadn't sat with mm -hmm. it in any real capacity before that bus trip in Cuba. And when I did, everything, the lid just blew off of everything. I remember sitting around the bus and looking at everybody and the driver and this young mom sitting next to me thinking, wow, at some point we are all going to meet our end, so why are we not talking about this? Mm -hmm. You know, every single individual. To me, it seemed to be the most important, the most pressing conversation that we could have. Uh, but when I started talking about it at parties, I realized other people mm. didn't think the same thing. Uh, they didn't want to be talking about it. So I, 
I mean, I think maybe by virtue of my level of tact or how important mm -hmm. I think this is, I can't help it. I just keep going and bulldozing <laughs> the conversation when people don't want to have it. Um, but what's been surprising is resistance. I can understand that it's very difficult for a lot of us to be in conversation about mortality, to, mm -hmm. to be real with the fact that one day our lives mm -hmm. will end. In order to do so, we have to acknowledge that we are not the main character in the story, mm -hmm. right? Our very egoic sense of self says that this is everything, and when I'm not here, then what? But acknowledging my mortality acknowledges that I am just but one note in a very vast symphony that's been going for centuries and will continue long after I die, provided AI doesn't kill us off early. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so stressed out about that later. Um, and so that's been really surprising to me, the resistance that people have to talking mm -hmm. about death and dying. But also surprising on the other side is when people do and start being with their mortality in a tangible way, either mm -hmm. through comprehensive end of life planning or being very uh, thoughtful about grief that they're experiencing, what is able to bloom in its place. Mm -hmm. The connections that people make, the, the willingness to, to take on their lives in a way that feeds them such that they can reach the end of their lives entirely satiated with this mm. really rich experience that we get to have. Uh, that is also surprising. Both things, both things, and one feeds the other. Both mm. things are true. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Dan, we just saw you get tears in your eyes, and I think we can all feel your love for Brittany, which is very present um, today and I, always. Um, could you talk about how the advocacy work that you've been doing and this mission that you've continued has affected you as a grieving person and your own process of grief? Sure. Um, for me, there's a lot of therapy in it, so I'm grateful for that, because the people that I talk to, I, I now work alongside um, palliative care physicians, hospice care workers. Mm -hmm. A lot of the conferences that I go to, that's who's on stage. And, um, so it's, it's very meaningful because, and, and by the way, I want to be clear, hospice and palliative care are wonderful fields within medicine and, and medically and dying is not at all a threat to that. It's simply a part of it. The vast majority of us with, with good hospice and palliative care can experience that gentle death. There are some cases, and Brittany's was one, where modern medicine can only do so much. You know, there's only so much morphine. That they, can, mm -hmm. that they can administer, essentially, you administer too much, and, well, that's euthanasia then, because it was a third person that contributed to that person's death. So I, I want to just, really, those are the, the superheroes of end-of-life care, a, a, along with death doulas, and, and there's many parts to it, but those fields of hospice and palliative care, Brittany had a wonderful team. Um, so I figured I would just interject that. but. The, the advocacy, yes, when I'm sitting across from a senator in some state house and trying to convince that individual that, um, I mean, the experience I just had in Nevada, 72% of Nevadans agree that a terminally ill individual should have the option of medical aid in dying. And yet the governor, who is new, it's his first term, he vetoed the bill. We got through both chambers, through the assembly, through the Senate sent the bill to his desk and he vetoes the bill. Now, if 72% of the state of Nevada is supportive of this, you kind of wonder, well, who are you representing? You're the governor, for crying out loud. So um, I've learned a lot about how politics work and, um, and, and you know, seeing how the sausage is made and all the, <laughs> the horse trading that occurs. And it's like, oh, I'll vote for this bill if mm -hmm. you vote for my bill. And, and, and that part, especially as it applies to this end of life, mm -hmm. the ability for an individual to simply, medically and dying, all it is is it, it does not result in more people dying. It simply results in fewer people suffering. And the fact that they just can't, they don't, they don't process that, and, and they vote because they have some religious institution yapping in their ear. That's frustrating, and I say that as a Catholic. I know I frustrate them when I testify. Um, so, yeah, I've certainly learned um, a lot of different how government works, and, um, but, but I guess for me personally, to, to get back to your question, 
there is therapy in it every time that I get to share Britney's story and then people mm -hmm. recognize uh, these are real people that we're talking mm -hmm. about. It's just not numbers or statistics. These are, it's, it's any one of us. Uh, and the fact that she was 29, you know, f the hope would be flip those numbers around, that you're mm -hmm. making these death decisions when you're 92. Mm -hmm. Well, in her case, she didn't get to live that long, mm -hmm. which kind of highlighted uh, to what Alou was saying is start thinking about this now. And once you set up your advanced health care directive and have mm -hmm. told your family what you want, it's a huge relief. Then you can go about party on, live your life, you know, um, and you don't have to worry about that end of life stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Katrina, so obviously your work is so focused around this really amazing, innovative design um, and leadership and advocacy too, but you're also running a real funeral home, again, with real people who are dying or who are really sad after the loss of a loved one um, and working closely with you and your team. So um, I'm curious what advice you might have for us about supporting people who are going through grief or a really hard time in general. Part of me feels like I'm not really, <clears throat> I'm not sure I'm the person to answer that question. To be honest, I um, Recompose is based in Seattle. We're, mm -hmm. we're expanding um, to other places. I have an amazing team mm -hmm. that works with the clients and their mm -hmm. families. Mm -hmm. And um, so I can only glean, you know, talk early about this stuff. It's, mm -hmm. it's feeling now like I'm repeating what everyone else is saying. Talk early about it. it it's, it's sad when a family, the person wanted to be composted, um, most of their family's on board, and then you have someone coming in and feeling whether or not it, it goes through with it. We go through with it, you know, feeling really sad about that option being chosen, or the flip, right? If you chose cremation and everyone was sad about that. So any conversation you can have up, up front is a good one. Um, I tend to think that there's um, something about being part of something bigger and knowing that we're part of something bigger, because we are, it is so hard not to focus on our own selves and in our own egos. But when I think about that, you know, forest and that mm. ecosystem and the decomposition and the renewal of life that's happening every single day forever. And then being able to kind of insert my, what was once myself into that cycle, mm. that the grandness of that gives me mm. comfort. Mm. And I think for some of our clients, we see that same comfort from the, the being able to join that just incredible, beautiful eco cycle that's out there. Yeah. I have one final mini question, which is, what have people used the soil for? Okay, my favorite story, I think, I'm not supposed to choose favorites, I'm guessing, but, <laughs> okay, half of our clients choose to donate the soil to conservation efforts. And, and so that means that soil goes to, in, in one particular case, a 700 acre conservation trust that, it's being regenerated by the nonprofit that's working on it. So half of our clients donate the soil because we're creating a full cubic yard per person because of all the plant material we compost you with. The other half come and they get it from our staff at Recompose. And one of my favorite stories is a person died and his sister came to Recompose and got the full cubic yard of soil. She brought a trailer. That's how it works. Mm. And our team filled that trailer up and she brought it home to his house in Seattle. And all of his neighbors with whom he'd gardened his whole life or like the mm. last 10 years as he'd lived there, they came with 10, 10 gallon buckets. They got some of Wayne's soil. They brought it home to their gardens mm. and he's still gardening with his friends wow. and family, you know, every afternoon. So. I love it. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, we have a little bit of time to do some audience questions. So would anybody like to ask a question? I'll call. Um, you were in a blue shirt. There's microphones there. And if you don't mind, you're welcome to introduce yourself if you'd like and um, direct your question to everyone or one of the people. Hi, I'm Samantha Darty. Uh, thank you all for sharing your really important stories. Um, I have a question. I wrote my capstone on palliative and hospice care utilization in the US. Um, as many of you probably know, only 20% of people who want 
excuse me, only 70% of the people in the US want to die at home and 20% actually do. A lot of this is due to what you're talking about, right? This incredible resistance to discuss end of life. And I'm wondering, based on your experiences, what do you see as the most promising ways to, to disband that resistance on both a systemic level, and we've talked a little bit about the individual level, so if you could focus on systemic, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Great. That's a great question. And if there are specific ways that people can support your work, please let us know that too. Who wants to go first? I think that maybe. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> well, as far as supporting the work that I do, just to get that part, um, uh, Compassion and Choices is the nonprofit that I work alongside. Um, and what was up on the screen, the BrittanyFund.org, um, that all links back to Compassion and Choices. Um, and this organization is so much more than just medical aid and dying. It's dealing with the, the, the one of the most common questions I get is uh, related to Alzheimer's and dementia. Well, what if a person has Alzheimer's? Can they pursue medical aid and dying? It's like, unfortunately, no. You are expressly prohibited because remember, mental competency, that's one of the requirements. So um, Compassion Choices deals with a lot of just the, the end of life care as a whole. Um, I don't have a, a magic pill or an answer for that, that question of how do you make, and it was, uh, Alua mentioned it earlier, getting people comfortable to talk about end of life, the, our, our collective mortality, recognizing that we, we, we all have a beginning, a middle, and an end. I mean, look where we are right now. We're in Aspen. And enjoying these views and, and being with one another, th this is life. So live this to the fullest, but don't be so afraid to, to discuss and talk about what comes next. I, my own personal thing is um, I say, especially for the last seven, eight years, uh, politics, as cantankerous as this has gotten and everybody's arguing over things, don't talk about any of that during Thanksgiving with your <laughs> loved ones and family. Seriously, after a few glasses of wine, <laughs> Bring up the topic and say, hey, you know what I would want at end of life? I would like to do this, this, and that. This has, I, I would be fine with, I don't want artificial hydration, nutrition, no ventilator. I would be comfortable with this, not comfortable with that. I would like to be uh, considered to recompose. I don't want to be, have these conversations. And they're, they're kind of, they're comical. You find out <laughs> things about your aunts and uncles and cousins um, so I view that as a perfect opportunity. Thanksgiving, have a few glasses of wine, bring up the topic and just see where it goes. Uh, it, it, it is kind of amusing. Uh, from a systemic standpoint, that one, I mean, I try from a legislative standpoint to get people to discuss um, uh, or acknowledge death and dying and you know, at times that, that's an uphill battle. So that one I, I don't have an answer for. I think an element um, yes, Thanksgiving, drunk, talking about death. It's <laughs> yeah. an incredible conversation. It's a good one. Uh, lots of juicy things come up. Uh, but I think uh, part of what, what is hard to answer about this question is it's such an individual conversation. Mm -hmm. But because of that, the change must occur on the individual level in order for it to affect the systemic. Uh, I want to mention, when I practiced law, I worked at Legal Aid. So what I'm sharing right now is vestiges of a grassroots organizing human, which is that we must change it on the individual level to affect the systems overall. At Going With Grace, we've been training death doulas now for five years. And so working really hard to, to um, support as many people as want to learn how to do this work to support the system overall. I think that in order for the systems to change, the individuals must first be entirely empowered to then change the systems. And so we're doing that in our small way by teaching folks, as many folks as possible, how to be with death and dying. This is not just people that want to do this professionally necessarily, but I think that everybody should have functional death literacy at some point. Mm -hmm. Most of us will serve as a death doula at some point mm -hmm. in our lives. And so we must all learn um, how to do it. And it's not complicated, it's not difficult. 
but it does take some really conscious awareness of and attention to in order to do it in a way that's effective. And I think once we're doing it effectively on the individual level, person by person, that ultimately leads to the breakdown of the systems that causes this challenge. Um, within that conversation, medical care systems, you know, one of the biggest challenges that we have there is that doctors aren't trying to say, yo, you're dying. Yeah. My brother-in-law, Peter St. John, died um, almost a year after I came back from Cuba. And I got to be with him for the last two months of his life. And I was pretty sure that Peter was dying, but nobody had said. Nobody had said. They said, well, we can't treat this anymore. We're going to try it like this, and maybe we'll try this, and this could be the outcome. But nobody flat out said to us, Peter is dying. And it broke my heart. And it was really isolating. And there was a bit of cognitive dissonance happening because, or maybe even it felt, uh, I knew the truth of what was happening, but nobody would acknowledge it. And it was sad and frustrating and difficult. Now, if I think medical professionals can also be with their mortality, mm -hmm. that might make it such that they are a little bit more comfortable to talk about other people. Mm -hmm. I hope, I, uh, I think. Great. Question here? Or, I'm sorry. Yeah. I think we should get another question. Microphone? What do we do at the end? The question is, what exactly do we do yeah. at the end? Of life. Mm. Hold. Mm. We hold. Mm. I hold. Um, the process looks a lot like, first, we've had an opportunity to be with the individual, what they want, what their life was, what it meant, who they cared about, what mattered to them, and forward as much of it into their dying as possible. And as we get closer and closer and closer to the end, holding all of that, holding the complexity of their lived experience, uh, holding their desires, their needs, their wishes, uh, also holding their regrets, their sadness, their grief, um, and doing our best to honor that life for what it was, uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, and also hold the grief of the people that love the person that died. Thank you for that question. Oh, it's my honor. In, oh, if I can just yeah. share, and I know I was lucky in that regard because that, what Alua just mentioned, with Brittany, she, a very spirited, determined individual, <clears throat> she really made that so easy just because mm -hmm. she knew exactly yeah. how she wanted to navigate uh, her end of life that um, my job was simply to be supportive. Uh, so I know that was a gift because I've seen in other family dynamics where there's arguing amongst the family and what direction do they go. But for me, for us, it was just like, whatever Brittany says, that's it. That's, that's what we're doing. Um, and that made it, um, that it just simplified things mm -hmm. because our, our role was, my job was just, I, I support her. Mm -hmm. Granted, it included having to leave our home and move to Oregon, um, which was, I mean, that's the time I want back, um, having to go through all of that. But her lending her voice to this cause, and you know, the, the media is the one that labeled her the face of medical aid and dying. That, she didn't set out to do that. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, her, her message was to legislators to try to affect change and, and pass laws. Um, but but for, for me, um, because of her personality and who she was, it, it certainly made it uh, easy uh, in that aspect. So. Someone had a question. Yeah, great. There's a microphone coming, just so that they include it all. Sorry, I, I come from, I'm a, a primary care provider and I work in pediatrics, so I think that's probably a little young to be talking about death and dying. Um, but I'm curious, you, everybody spoke to, we, we want to talk about this stuff earlier, we want, you, we want to have a plan. I think the Thanksgiving thing is incredible, I'm taking that home. Um, but I'm also curious if you guys ever work with primary care providers, especially as a death doula, um, especially talking about end of life what happens with your body after you die. Do you, do you see an opportunity for training, talking to physicians about their own mortality, training medical providers 
because so much of our training is about the resistance, about the fight against the disease, and the letting go is not, it is not part of training, at least it wasn't part of mine. Um, and so I think one of the things that I have learned being in practice is um, the not talking about it is what creates the fear. And so how do we bring that, you know, we talk about, in PEDS we talk about safety, we talk about sunscreen, we talk about car seats, and we, like we never talk about like letting go and not, let's not think about worst case scenario for our kids. Let's talk about how to empower them. How do we put that into a primary care setting to have those conversations early and often? Have you guys, do you know where those conversations start besides at the kitchen table? I think they begin in training and education systems uh, for doctors, palliative care. I, I think they begin in education, that we need mm -hmm. functional death literacy across the board. I think that any definition of health that does not also include death is incomplete. It's, yeah. it's failed, you know, right at the outset, it's incomplete. And so we need to train folks to think about the, the body, the whole person, um, the entirety of their life, because the entirety of their life also includes their death. So to leave that out does everybody a disservice. Most of all, the person who's dying, the people around them, but societally as well. I would, I would add that it's not ever too young to talk to kids about death. I don't know that it needs to happen in a, phys you know, a physician's office, <laughs> but um, when I started 10 years ago, my kids were little and they got it so fast. Oh, the life cycle. Oh, right. It's, they got a little confused in there sometimes. When, when a chicken dies and then, and then lays an egg, and then, well, <laughs> not, not quite, but, oh. and then decomposes, and then creates grass, and then that chicken eats the grass. You know, kids are so good at, at getting this stuff, and if you can talk to them before it's, it's, they have to talk about it before they've even lost someone, then that experience is just gonna be more palatable, easier to understand, not to take the grief away, but easier to understand. Um, when my uh, mother-in-law died, my, I just watched both of my young kids like just be able to, to support the adults in their, they were watching how we were interacting with each other during that grieving period. And they, I watched them both in their own ways, they're two young boys, like model us and, and actually do better than we were doing at grieving, at looking each other in the eyes and hugging, each, you know, just those basic, those basic moments. So I guess what I'm, mm -hmm. I, I would urge you to talk to the youngest of the young and just keep talking about it as, as they grow. From an education standpoint and getting this into the curriculum uh, for med medical students, Brittany is in three textbooks. Mm -hmm. So um, <clears throat> those, those publishers reached out and said, could we include her stories? Like, sure. That's cool. So as much as we can, that's, I agree, we need to get into mm -hmm the um, medical student curriculum that includes yeah. death is, is just part of the training. Fabulous. So we're now at the close of our session. Um, I'd like to read a poem, actually, that we could all share. Um, and then please do feel free to come up and talk with the panelists also informally. Um, so this poem uh, is called Selah at 83, and um, my late husband was a writer who wrote the memoir, When Breath Becomes Air, and it was from this poem that he created the title for the book. Um, this poem is really short. It's about kind of the intertwining of life and death and about recognizing and making the most of your life in the context of your mortality. So this is by Greville, and he wrote, you that seek what life is in death, now find it air that once was breath. New names unknown, old names gone, till time end bodies but souls none. Reader, then make time while you be but steps to your eternity. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you.